This morning's webinar is all about Smiley Library's Home Movie Preservation Project. Several of our most important projects over the last several years have been to leverage technology to make our collections more accessible. For example, photographic prints are relatively straightforward to look at, but what about 35 millimeter slides? Much less accessible today. We've now scanned thousands of slides so the images can be easily accessed through our computers. The same is true for home movies. How many people still have the equipment to show them? Fortunately for us, a wonderful donor came forward and contributed the funds that allowed the library to acquire some remarkable new tools to save home movies for the future. time putting that together. Very groovy mu music too. Well, let's start with a little bit of context. The standard 8mm, also known as regular 8, film format was developed by Eastman Kodak during the Great Depression and realized to the market in 1932, uh, released to the market in 1932, to create a home movie format that was less expensive than 16mm. In 1965, Super 8 film was released and was quickly adopted by the amateur filmmaker. It featured a better quality image. The Super 8 format was designed from the start to accommodate a soundtrack as well. So here's our first and only poll for today. Was your childhood or that of members of your family captured on eight millimeter Super 8 or 16 millimeter home movies? Very interesting. All right, we'll give you a couple more seconds. Okay. So it, 
58% of you who responded said yes, your childhoods or those of people you know were recorded on film. 38% uh, said no, and 4% can't remember, maybe. I'm not gonna make any jokes about maybe it was so long ago, so don't worry. Okay. Oops. One of the interesting things that when, when we get the people bringing in film footage is that sometimes they are actually labeled, which is really helpful, but a lot of the time they're not. So when they're little handwritten notes, things like that, it's really great for us to be able to go in. Uh, sometimes we have to watch the film and then try to figure it out for ourselves. Every once in a while inside the box, we'll find interesting stuff like the instructions for how to use the film. Um, these little artifacts that have come along with these, with these films, some, some of them for 80 years or more. Even though something may not have come out of a box for quite a long time, some of it has to get a little bit cleaned. And so we have a method of using a really non-invasive cleaner to go through uh, films to clean them up so that when we go ahead and scan them, it will be uh, as clear a picture as possible. One of the things that we sometimes have to do is add leader to uh, either the beginning or the end in order to make sure we capture all of the frames of the film. And this enables us to get as much out of it as possible. So here's just an example of the end of a reel, something that might look very familiar to you. You see those little perforations that went by. I remember watching the TV show The Wonder Years as a kid uh, in the 1980s and as part of their intro um, to the series every day, every week, it included what looked like home movie footage and the little dots went by. It didn't occur to me at the time what that meant, but you can see in the image on the left, the dots are actually perforations that give the film a code. And then the box is also perforated with the same code. It's hard to see here. If we reverse it, you can see 149 uh, is, is on the underside of it as well, because it obviously goes all the way through. So that would be a way that you could keep the film with the correct box and make sure it gets back to the correct people who submitted the film for processing. What makes the project that we've got going on a little different technology-wise is, you know, it used to be what you would do is basically put film in a projector and project it onto a wall and then use a video camera of some kind to record the image that is being projected or some variation on that. What our equipment does actually is have a, a still camera and this little light is a sensor that clocks each of the sprocket holes. And that's what tells the camera to take a picture. So really what it's doing is it's taking thousands and thousands of individual photographs, one for each frame, and then the software stitches it together into a motion picture, which is why we get such a high quality um, creation from the films. So here's what it looks like in motion. Actually, film being done, you can see over here on the screen, the speed at which it's taking these images. See the numbers on the bottom left of the frame where it says the number of frames. That's the number of individual photographs it's taken up to that point. So it's really fast, which is great. So we can go through uh, a number of films in an afternoon, for example. One of the interesting things that we've had to figure out is that not every camera works at exactly the right, exactly the same speed, especially the early, uh, earliest films. So this was an example of some film that uh, we rendered first at 18 frames per second. And it's a parade on uh, Citrus Avenue. I'll tell you more about it in a minute. But you go through and it looks, maybe these people are walking a little more quickly um, than looks natural, especially for a parade. So we, let's step it down here. Is the same segment uh, at 15 frames per second. You know, that looks a little more realistic. The, the wind and the flag and some of the banners looks more realistic. Um, the speed at which they're walking. So may, maybe this is pretty close, uh, we can see.
incidentally, this is just east of Redlands Boulevard. Now let's take a look, slow it down a little bit more at 12 frames per second, see how what kind of a difference that makes. And I think now if you look at it, you realize this is probably a little bit too slow. Um, and maybe 15 frames a second is a more uh, realistic look for the film. So here's the complete uh, reel of this parade from 1932. It's really interesting because using the outfits and the subjects of the floats as keywords, uh, Maria was able to track down the parade, the date, and the theme, which happened to be George Washington and his times uh, through a newspaper database search. So here we are on Citrus Avenue, right there at the intersection with today's Redlands Boulevard before Highway 99 was created. And you can see the, uh, we're looking north, here's the State Street Christian Church in the background. Uh, you can see there, the future home of the AMPM Arco uh, there on the corner, which was actually already a filling station there. And now the parade has begun. And you can see all of the late 18th century style clothing or the probably we wouldn't do it quite like this today, the uh, representations of native peoples by members of the parade walking down the street. Revolutionary War themes. They were very proud in the write-up that no automobiles were included in this parade at all. Declaration of Independence floats. If you happen to recognize anyone in this parade, please let us know, because we'd love to know who these people are. I don't know if everybody went out to Western costume and in Hollywood and, and got all these costumes, but they certainly were very thorough in the representations of the, of the period. The Washington Monument. Must have been very colorful to see all of the florals on the different wagons and floats. They really knew how to throw a parade, even though it was in the depths of the Great Depression. Well, one of the things you'll notice is that and this is a function of the computer and the camera and how it picks up the image, but you get all of that noise. Do you see the speckly uh, speckle in the sky, on the, especially on the left side? Um, that's noise that comes up. You wouldn't see that if you were projecting it onto a, a flat uh, white wall, but it's a function of the camera. So there is actual um, software that we can use to eliminate or dramatically reduce that noise. So here's an example. We'll take the original clip. So that's what it looks like as it's going by. You can, you can see all the noise that's there. 
then we're going to use this special computer plugin called Neat Video and apply it. And you can see how much cleaner it is now. Incidentally, that sign was just uh, re neoned. And if you haven't been past Jenny Davis Park and New York Street uh, after dark to see it, it is a real stunner. Um, fortunately, we were able to provide the city with a color photograph of that sign illuminated at night. So they knew exactly what the colors were. And when the sign was restored, it now is exactly as it should have been uh, all this time. It's really stunning and beautiful. We also can capture audio. This requires us to go through a projector and output the sound. But what this little device does is right in the center there, it has a sensor and it is able to figure out the shutter speed in the projector, from the projector and count the number of frames. Uh, and that is the information it sends to the computer as it's recording the audio. And then what we do is we render the original video file at a, a specific frame rate and we tell the audio file to render at the same frame rate and then in software we're able to combine those two and it is absolutely perfectly aligned. So here's an example. There goes Susan in to fix the juice for our breakfast. You know how little girls are about helping mother. Susan just insists. And it is easy for her, now that we're drinking real gold. That's the new concentrated orange base that keeps without freezing. Instead, you store it in its small can in a cupboard. So much easier to mix. No big icy chunks to thaw. See? It pours out. Just add to water and stir. No, Susan, not with your finger. Well, it does taste good. So fresh. Real Gold's new low temperature process concentrates that California Valencia orange flavor and keeps it at its best, right up to the time you mix and chill it. And it's loaded with vitamin C. As Susan says, I don't know why they call it Real Gold when it's really real orange. Are you caught in the squeeze of high frozen juice prices? Real Gold Orange Base is today's best breakfast juice buy. Of course, Real Gold was part of Pure Gold, and the Real Gold office was on Brookside Avenue on the east side of the intersection at Center Street, uh, across from the Fax Building, uh, across from Center. It was there for a number of years. Well, just like with still photography, people recorded moments that were important and extraordinary. Remember, film was not inexpensive, and if you only had 50 feet worth in your camera, which was a standard real size, you had to be judicious about what you recorded on film. Of course, this project really aims to record uh, anything about life in Redlands, from, you know, backyard birthday parties to civic events to you name it. Anything that we can do to document the past is a great help for the future. So let's start with some of the interesting life in Redlands moments that we've captured from uh, donors so far. This is 1942, and the Dickerson family is playing in front of their house on Alvarado Street. Of course, the extraordinary events are things like this. Yes, the, of course, the irony of sunny California, and here we have the snow. I imagine if you lived in North Dakota or Massachusetts or something like that, you probably wouldn't be running outside with your eight or 16 millimeter home movie camera to record the snow, but it's such an unusual event in Redlands that that's the kind of thing that would happen here. This is the Hilliard home on Terracina Boulevard. You gotta love that you go out in the snow in your fur and pearls to have a snowball fight. that looks kind of like Aunt B from the Andrew Griffith Show. And here we are on the quad at the U of R from the same reel of film. It's interesting to see not only are they playing, but in terms of time, this is before the massive oak trees of today were even planted.
Oh, sorry, there's, this is a little glitch, but it'll pick up in a second. There you have the east, the west side of the quad uh, residence halls in the background there. Trying to start the car in the cold. This is actually early color film. The colors, the dyes that were used to make the color have faded over time, but this was actually color when it was shot. And you can still make out a little bit of the color. It's my favorite part about being in Redlands is that in the winter, I can see the snow on the mountains and know that that's as close as I ever need to get to it. Well, we've come across other interesting little bits like here's the Redlands Bowl Procellus only a few years after it was completed. Another remarkable thing is seeing things that are important events, but actually seeing them in motion. We have photos of the 1938 flood, which was so dramatic that it changed the course of part of the Santa Ana River, caused massive flooding in places like San Bernardino, um, took out parts of Mill Creek. Uh, the damage in Redlands was not that severe, but here you can see what the Santa Ana River torrent did to rail lines, to houses, um, you can see where the water line was on the side of that automobile back there. The, this flood actually is what washed out the bridge over the river for the Santa Fe and ended travel for rail service uh, on the eastern loop of the kite-shaped track. There are great shots we've come across of, of school life. So here we are at Mission Elementary in the 1950s. Before we had Cope Middle School, we had Redlands Junior High School, which is now the site of the north campus of Redlands High School. And here are Redlands High School. With the marvelous administration building in the background there, it was demolished in the, in the 1950s and juxtapose that with the new. Also interesting stuff that's come up a whole series of films of Redlands High School basketball from the 1960s and into the early 1970s. Or how about here, here we've got a brownie group at a, and a school uh, Thanksgiving party.
this is a particularly interesting series um, to me because in the post-World War II period, Redlands exploded in terms of, of population and housing creation. And the Payne family bought their lot and decided to actually record on film its entire construction. So this subdivision is just south of Brookside Avenue. Uh, it's called Dale, part of the street is Dale Lane. It's part of this little one. And you can see from the early grading uh, of what had been a citrus grove. And here they are with what would be their future home. Even the list of all the extras that they would be adding to the, to the house. You can see the plumbing going in. Beautiful winter day. Early laying out on the streets. You can see some curb is already in, laying foundations. Slab on grade construction. It's a relatively uh, recent phenomenon at that time. You can see that the house is beginning to sprout up from the ground. The Payne daughter is out surveying their, their future neighborhood. And the lumbers arrived to start the framing. Looks like it recently rained. Imagining knocking on the front door. The whole neighborhood's coming together now. Chimneys up, roofing materials arriving. The built-up roof was very popular at this time for buildings that had very low sloping uh, roofs or flat. Some people call it tar and gravel. You might know it by that name better. Now it looks like a lot of the walls are up and you can really picture in their minds how the house will be when it's finished. What's really kind of remarkable about this whole series of films from the Payne family is that they were brought to the library by someone who discovered a box of eight millimeter films uh, in a trash can and didn't know what was on them, none of them was labeled, but thought that th they were probably not something that should just go to the landfill and brought them into the heritage room. This was in about 2016 and we didn't really have any way to view them uh, until we got this equipment. So it was one of the first things that we did once the equipment arrived and we were absolutely stunned and amazed by the content of these films because it shows a whole development of the community that we didn't have any kind of moving record for. So the drywall is now in on the inn of doors and the kitchen cabinetry is getting uh, assembled to be installed. Sidewalks poured. Can finish grading the street so it can get paved.
and ever closer to that move-in day. Now they're ready. Oh, there's other stuff that was fun that we've captured, of course, as well. Easter in the 1950s. The Paynes were members of First Congregational Church, and so Mr. Payne brought the camera down Easter morning. Notice that there is no electric stoplight at that intersection yet. There's still a stop sign. Fox Theater in the background. <laughs> Other aspects of life in Redlands. Some of you may be members of the Fifth Avenue Swim Club, which is a converted reservoir. This is Fourth of July excitement. This is footage that was created by Ron, Dr. Ron Helbrun uh, of his family and others at the Fifth Avenue Swim Club for Independence Day. And then architect Ben Robbie, we're not quite sure why, but he took a couple of reels of eight millimeter film that ended up at the Heritage Room of State Street, somewhere around 1980. That's State looking west from 6th. He also took some of Smiley Library. Many of you may remember when the library was still painted white, uh, which it was until 2002, before it was returned to its original color. The assembly room wing. and inside the library. I'm sure they must have had their reasons for taking out the original chandeliers and installing banks of ghastly fluorescent lighting. Uh, and the Lincoln Memorial Shrine, of course, before it was expanded in 1998. He also took footage inside the Redland Safety Hall, which of course was demolished a year or so ago. Inside the circular uh, room that was used as the council chambers for the city council between 1962 and the early 19. 90s when they moved over to the current City Hall location. Of course, civic milestones are some of those extraordinary events that were often captured on film. In 1938, Redlands celebrated its 50th anniversary as an incorporated city. And there was major production of events throughout that year. And in the fall, they had the 1938 Golden Jubilee Parade, which I think looks pretty over the top by today's standards. Uh, really extraordinary.
So we were excited to see this film as, uh, as we were going through them, as things were being developed. It's funny because in 1938, those cars weren't so old. Of course, they look ancient to us today. Well, I bet you were watching that and wondering, what a great film, if only we could see it in color. Well, guess what? Someone did record the 1938 Golden Jubilee Parade with color film. And this is actually taken from On Cajon Street with their backs to the Methodist Church and that's the Congregational Church in the background. And here you see much of the same uh, sections of the parade, but now you can see them uh, in color. It's the Baptist Church in the background. That dog was a very good sport. And that was all fruit that made the sun-kissed entry. Dragging the plow then and now with the tractor. <laughs> well, in 1963, the city celebrated its Diamond Jubilee. So here we have the lineup for the parade. This was actually taken by Fred Ford. And uh, it's great because it's in color, but you can see how much has changed just in 25 years because the freeway is in the background. So they're lining up on Colton Avenue near 6th Street. Then 
the soon to be Stardust Motel under construction in the background. Fred's daughter getting into the car. Leon Armentrout, the uh, local architect. Kathy Hales Stockton. And then what I really like about this film is that it captures the parade from the vantage point of a participant in the parade. So here they are going down through downtown Redlands. Um, pretty, pretty neat stuff. Well, of course, people didn't always just stay in Redlands. They recorded life uh, not only at home, but the places that they visited. The Ramona pageant was a, still is, uh, a dramatization of Helen Hunt Jackson's very popular uh, novel, Ramona, a Story, that was uh, written and then published in the 1880s and is responsible for a huge, um, a huge part of tourism to Southern California. So this is out in Hemet. Seems like it must have been a, one of those quintessential cast of thousands kind of productions. Well, people didn't just go in 1938. Here we are in the 1950s. In the same location to see the same pageant. Some of you may remember going to Santa's Village up in the San Bernardino Mountains as a child uh, or with your children. Or how about Knott's Berry Farm? Back when you could actually find boysenberries at Knott's Berry Farm. Go get your chicken dinner from Mrs. Knott. Fast forward a couple years, Knott's Berry Farm has changed a little bit. in the early 1960s here. And then fast forward to the 1970s. Now we're ready to come home. And we're going to Knoxbury Farm. Now, now we're getting on the train. Picture of us on the train waiting. Now here are the ladies. But of course, no visit to anywhere in Southern California would be complete with, without a trip to the happiest place on earth. Connie, Chrissy, and Karen. We are waiting. <laughs> Right around on the jungle cruise. Here we are going on the jungle cruise. There's Chrissy. And there's the crocodiles. And there's the king of the beast in a spider. 
And there's elephants squirting water. There's the big one. And there's a big elephant. And there's some animals. There's giraffe and zebras and lions. birds. And there's um, a hippo. Karen. He's trying to bite us. And there's a man, an Indian. And there's the haunted man. Well, you never know what might pop up in the middle of a reel, even if the reel is labeled. That's why we actually digitize each reel that we get, because sometimes there are hidden gems. So that is the triangle with the oak tree right at the intersection of Cajon, Orange, and Citrus. Um, it's just about three seconds of film in the middle of this reel, um, but it's the first film footage we have that really showed it very well before the telephone building was expanded and the Streets were sort of realigned and all of that. And this is an interesting little blip that's even, even faster. So if you blink, you're gonna miss it. This is getting ready for a, a christening. Did you see that little blip? This is what it looks like if we freeze a frame. And if you guess that that's the Redlands Bull Priscillus, you are correct. And it's only like, three frames or something like that in the middle of this this other film so that's kind of interesting too and then there's other fun fun stuff that we came across like um ron helbrin experimented with stop action animation And I'll close it with that. As you can see, my childhood was also recorded on Super 8 film. So if you or someone you know has film that depicts life in Redlands, uh, we would love to see it. Uh, the deal that we've, we've managed to put together is that if you're willing to let us digitize it and use it for future research and potential exhibition for Museum of Redlands, then we will digitize it at absolutely no cost to the uh, owner of the film and give digital copies of it as well. Uh, we will also accept it as a donation, but if the, if the uh, owner would like to have the original film back, that's okay with us too. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, project and we've got a number of great submissions. We hope in, in the not too distant future we'll be able to put together another series of, of films for you all to see. Mm -hmm.